uh, getting seated and, and getting ready for the next session to start. Uh, we would like to call your attention to the image which is here on the screen. Uh, this is the Chinese translation of the Moon Village Association uh, promotional website. So this is our, our uh, promotion in, uh, in China. Yeah, yeah we, we need one in Japanese as well. Yes. <laughs> we need a translation into Japanese as well as... Uh, <laughs> If we could uh, go ahead and uh, uh, get started. So uh, this afternoon's uh, session begins uh, with the follow-on to this morning's plenary. Uh, and uh, we have a series of um, uh, rapid-fire talks, each one about 10 minutes in duration, uh, each one from a subject matter expert uh, or uh, engineer or technologist or um, uh, some other uh, uh, interested and knowledgeable party concerning some aspect of the moon, uh, its study, and the prospects for a moon village. Uh, we will begin with um, uh, Ian Crawford. Uh, professor Crawford is uh, the professor of planet planetary science and astrobiology at Birkbeck College at the University of London and vice president of the Royal Astronautical Society. Um, and a member of uh, ESA's uh, Human Exploration Advisory Committee. Professor Crawford. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, th thank, you uh, thank you, everybody. Good, good afternoon. Perhaps we could dim the lights a little bit because I think it will make the slides a bit easier to see. So I, I was asked to speak about science on the moon, which is a huge, a huge topic and can't be done in 10 minutes. But I will try and give you a flavour for why I think the Moon Village would uh, facilitate scientific exploration of the Moon. I just wanted to start off though by saying that even though I'm here to try and give the science case for returning to the Moon and the Moon Village, um, I don't believe that the science is by any means the only or even the main reason for wanting to uh, return to the Moon or to establish a Moon Village. Uh, because as Professor Werner did say yesterday, there's a wide variety of reasons uh, but they, they all boil down really to the, the top bullet point here. The moon is the next logical step in human, in human space exploration. I think there's wide agreement on, on, on that. And so by returning to the moon, humanity will establish a foothold into the solar system that can be used both for fundamental science but also for many other, many other benefits will also follow. So the, 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 the benefits will follow from building a, a return to the moon and establishing a moon village. There are economic benefits, which we'll hear quite a lot about, I'm sure, both short term for economic benefits for industry and commercial activities, and then longer term using the resources of the moon and using the moon as a launch pad into the solar system to access the resources of the solar system. These will all be economic benefits. So geopolitical benefits, of which the primary geopolitical benefit is certainly the stimulus of international cooperation. Um, I think if we can have here a global activity of exploring the moon and the wider solar system, this probably would be the most important legacy that the moon village can, can deliver, even, uh, even over and above the other things. There are clearly cultural benefits in, in, in as far as we would expand, expand human horizons and make ourselves aware 
of uh, things in the in the universe which we just will never become aware of if we just stay sitting on our home planet and by getting out there into the universe we'll come across weird and wonderful things that we can't dream of at the moment which will surely have a, a significant cultural impact uh, but then there are the scientific benefits which is what I said I would uh, speak about so I think the primary the context for the, the scientific benefits of, re of returning to the moon and establishing a, a moon village or a, a lunar infrastructure really we can argue by analogy as to how we explore remote parts of the earth and in particular, I think the Antarctic research stations provide a key uh, paradigm for how science would benefit, scientific exploration would benefit from the establishment of a, a moon village. So this shows the Amundsen Scott, the Amundsen Scott uh, station at the, at the lunar South Pole. And the thing about l lunar uh, Antarctic research stations like the, like the Amundsen Scott station is that they facilitate they provide a scientific infrastructure that facilitates a lot of scientific activities that just wouldn't happen otherwise. So if you consider all the work that is supported by the Antarctic research stations, so a lot of astronomy, a lot of geophysics, a lot of biology, a lot of climate science, and it all relies on having infrastructure in, 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 in polar, polar research stations. So just for example, here is, here is this, the Amundsen Scott station. Here, and, but, Having this, this infrastructure in Antarctica enables scientists to go out into the field in Antarctica to do this tremendous range of scientific exploration. So astrobiology research in the dry valleys, which are used as a Mars analog site, collecting uh, meteorites that fall in Antarctica and collected, so that field expeditions go out from these bases into the ice, uh, onto the ice searching for meteorites. Uh, drilling down into subglacial sub lakes like Lake Vostok, but there are about 400 of these subglacial lakes now, now known, which can be accessed as analogues for exploring the outer solar system and the icy moons. And I don't think you can see it well here, but this is the surface infrastructure for the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory um, at, the, at, the, at the South Pole, which is used as a, um, obviously that's an astrophysics observatory. But the point is, all of these different sciences are supported by having a... Um, a human infrastructure in, on the Antarctic continent in the form of a relatively small number of, of permanently, permanently manned research stations. So science would benefit simulely by having a comparable infrastructure on, on the lunar surface. Um, so I don't have time to go, this is, this is my short list of all the scientific reasons for wanting to return to the moon. Certainly don't have time to go through, through all of these. Um, but I did, I did summarise them in a paper that I presented in Torino in, 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 over the summer at a very interesting meeting that was organised by Giancarlo Genta and Giuseppe uh, on, 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 the moon, on the Moon Village and beyond. So I can get, anyone's interested, I can provide you a copy with this paper, Science Enabled by a Moon Village. But the top level bullet, I mean each of these bullet points contains within it a multitude of other sub-disciplines and scientific topics. But broadly, a return, to the, a return to the moon would clearly enable us better understanding of the moon itself as a geological object. Uh, and a moon is an excellent example of a small rocky planet whose internal geological processes shut down quite early after its formation. So frozen in time, we have in the moon the early history of the geological evolution of a rocky planet, um, which more active planets like the Earth and Mars have largely eroded or destroyed. Um, then in addition to that geological history, the, the lunar surface, uh, as a second bullet point, the lunar surface I've written is a museum of solar system history. And that is because the lunar surface, so this is Jack Schmidt at the Apollo 17 London site. Um, but oh, the, the, the lunar surface has been exposed to the space environment for four and a half thousand million years, which depends on which part of the moon you go to, but parts of it have been exposed for, for essentially the whole history of the solar system. And because the moon has no atmosphere and the moon has no magnetic field, things coming in from space land in the surface regolith where potentially they can be found. So examples would be meteorites, obviously, from, from elsewhere in the solar system, but also cosmic rays from the galaxy and solar wind particles from the sun. All of this activity is potentially preserved in the near, the near surface environment of the, uh, of the moon. I'll come back to that point if I have time shortly. Um, then in addition, as has already been pointed out, the Moon provides a platform for astronomical observations. Certainly the far side is generally considered the best place in the solar system one could go to for low frequency radio astronomy, as it's continuously shielded from the, uh, from the Earth. Uh, but other astronomies also would benefit or have the potential to benefit from the, um, 
from being established on the, on the lunar surface, um, especially infrared instruments in permanently shadowed polar craters where the temperature might be 25 Kelvin and passive, passive cooling of the instrumentation would be um, uh, possible. Uh, platform for life sciences investigations. I mean, I was delighted to see in the Team Indus presentation how many of those students suggested experiments were, were life sciences experiments designed to see how cyanobacteria respond to the lunar environment. And finding out how life responds to a, 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 a low gravity, but not microgravity, a low but non-zero gravity in a harsh radiation environment, there's both fundamental biology to be learned there, uh, but of course also biological knowledge which will be useful to us as we move out further into the solar system ourselves. And not only do we have to keep humans fit and healthy uh, operating on other planetary surfaces, but presumably we want to eat things. We'll have bio, uh, life support systems that may have biological components. And so the Moon is an excellent place for learning all of this both fundamental biology and practical biology. Um, and then that sort of feeds partly into the last bullet point. That, uh, but, and, and Professor Werner made the point uh, excellently yesterday that the Moon is an obvious test bed for future exploration activities further into the solar system and of course that, that further exploration will itself yield scientific benefits as we explore Mars and the outer solar system it will all be part of a legacy of, um, of what we might learn on the Moon right so I see I've only got two minutes left so uh, anyone's interested I'll send, send me an email and I'll send you this paper uh, right, so just very, very briefly, I just want to link astronomy with geology here, because amongst the long list of scientific benefits we have from returning to the moon, there is this link between astronomy and geology. So this shows a solar flare, and hence solar flares it, it, uh, cause enhancements in the solar wind, and, and solar particle events lead to enhancements in the solar wind, and all of those charged particles get implanted onto the lunar surface because the moon has no magnetic field and no atmosphere. Similarly, this is a spiral galaxy. This is Messier 51. If this were our galaxy, we'd be about here. And during the history of the solar system, we've been around the ga our galaxy about 20 times. And as we've gone around the galaxy 20 times, we've been through spiral arms. We've probably been packed close to exploding stars. We've been through dust clouds. All of this information is also potentially recorded in the near surface lunar environment. Now, to access it will require a certain amount of infrastructure. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the things that we might be interested in, ancient solar wind particles, galactic cosmic rays, micrometeorites, etc., probably will be buried. It's the kind of activity that would certainly benefit from a human presence on, on, on the moon, uh, and, yet a, and, a, and a moon village type infrastructure that can support this kind of exploratory activity. I mean, the analogy here would be like the people, the geophysicists who go out in tents in Antarctica from the Amundsen Scott Station to do geophysics in remote places in Antarctica, and then they have to come back to the, uh, the, 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 the Antarctic base, which supports all this infrastructure, maintains it, and, and, and permits exploratory activity that just wouldn't happen without that infrastructure being present. Um, it's just an example, right? I could make similar examples based on astronomy or life sciences. This particular example of the early history of the solar system buried in the lunar surface is one that just happens to interest me personally. And so this is my last slide, so I think I've already made the point. Uh, what we would re Science would benefit incredibly from having a scientific infrastructure, aka a moon village that approximated something like what we have in the Antarctic continent. And, and it's been mentioned a couple of times already, the moon village, however we envisage it, um, is, is consistent with the overall goals of the global exploration strategy for being produced by the ISEG partners. Um, now, the ISEG partners are currently working on the next iteration of the Global Exploration Roadmap, um, but I think it's clear the Moon Village and Lunar Exploration fits uh, comfortably. It could become an integral part of the next version of the Global Exploration Roadmap, and so I commend this to you. You'll find, it, obviously you'll find this on the web if you Google it at the ISEG website. Right, I'd better finish there. Thank you very much. In the interests of uh, time, and since we got started a little late after lunch, I apologize, but uh, we don't have time for any questions. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Kyle uh, Asierno. Are you here? Yes. Uh, he's the managing director of iSpace Europe and responsible for executing, executing business strategies with a particular focus on uh, lunar mining. Thank you. And, uh, I'm assuming they're going to 
certainly have to. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just want to start by uh, saying thank you. Thank you to Dr. Ribaldi for the leadership that you've shown in bringing us all together, and a big thank you to ISU for hosting this event. Uh, it was just two years ago when I was a student at ISU in the master's program, uh, sitting there like you, looking at the speakers and thinking, one day, am I going to get a job? And uh, I have to really say thank you to the people who uh, sub supported me since I graduated, uh, to the members of the board who continue to help this program and build, uh, build the next workforce, and also to the students in the room uh, to let you know that there are uh, availabilities at iSpace. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to working with you. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to explain a little bit more about iSpace and, and what we're doing. <sighs> and talk about how that fits into the Moon Village. So first, let me say that uh, our company is solely focused on extending human presence out uh, into outer space. Uh, we're a lunar-focused company, and that is all that we're doing. Uh, we are growing quite substantially. This is uh, us about two years ago. We were seven or eight people. Uh, last year, we doubled in size to 20. And then this year again, we, we double again to 40. And by the end of 2018, we will likely double again to 80, uh, 80 people. And we're from all over the world. So the, the company is a Japanese company, but we, um, we employ people from all ends of the planet. Uh, a lot of space experience that we have. And uh, we're really trying to make it an international company as well, international from the beginning. Uh, so we have three offices right now. We have an office in uh, Japan. Obviously, our headquarters are there. We have another office that we opened up in Luxembourg recently, which I'll talk about. And finally, we have an office at NASA Ames. Um, at NASA Ames, we're working with one of the resource prospector teams, and that's working on uh, one of their specific lunar missions. In Luxembourg, we were the third company to arrive in Luxembourg, and we signed an MOU to do the resource prospect, uh, pardon me, the roving spectrometer mission. And then I'm going to talk about right now the Google Lunar X Prize and how that's coming along. So when we envision the, the steps and the path moving forward for iSpace, we've basically broken it down to first steps, uh, three different steps. And the first step for us is to demonstrate this technology that we've been working on for so many years. And we intend to do that with the Google Lunar X Prize. After that, we want to continue to use our technology to do prospecting, so to better understand uh, what the lunar surface is made up of, what opportunities exist. And finally, if we're successful in finding that we can uh, economically exploit the resources that are on the lunar surface, we want to move to a, a stage where we'll be extracting, processing, and eventually delivering these resources to customers in cis-lunar space. So our first phase is the Google Lunar X Prize. And I think by this time, if you haven't heard about the Google Lunar X Prize, you're not in the space industry. Uh, I wonder if I can get some sound on this. I'm looking up at Joel, who's my sound man. If not, I'll briefly explain uh, how this works. To win the prize, you have to get to space. Uh, you have to land on the moon. Then you have to drive 500 meters. And if you travel 500 meters, take HD video, and send that video back to Earth, then you win the, the grand prize. Uh, this has to be done by March 31st. And it has to be done with private capital. This is one of the most difficult things. You can't just get money from a government. We had to raise money privately, and I'll explain how we did that. <clears throat> uh, originally, there were five teams. There we go. Uh, originally, there were 34 teams, and now there's just five. Uh, these are the five remaining teams that are in the race. Um, there's Hakuto, Team Indus, Space Isle, Moon Express, and Synergy Moon. And you heard from, from Team Indus and, uh, already today. Uh, they are our partner, and uh, a lot of people ask us about, well, how does this work? Because Team Indus also has a rover. They also have a lander. Uh, what's going to happen? And uh, actually, we see this as a, as a great opportunity for Team Indus because there's some redundancy built into the system. Obviously, we are rover experts, and uh, we've been working a lot on their rovers. Team Indus has done a fantastic job with their lander and the rover, but let's say that their rover doesn't work, but the lander does. 
well then we can still complete that second end of the mission and we can uh, travel that 500 meters and, and potentially win that 20 million. And Team Indus has promised us that if we're getting really close to the 500 meters, they're not going to just shut off the communication. <laughs> right? Guys, please. So, <laughs> so promise. Um, <clears throat> so we're working really closely again to, to, to cooperate on this mission and, and hopefully achieve it. So um, we're really hoping that everything goes well and please launch us to the moon very safely, guys. Now, one of the reasons that we were actually successful and able to partner with Team Innocent in, in the beginning was because we were able to raise money through sponsorship. And we basically took this approach of uh, like NASCAR, where you put the logos onto the, onto the rover and you sell sponsorship opportunities. Um, some of these companies you might be familiar with, uh, for example, IHI, if you're in the aerospace industry, or Suzuki, or Japan Airlines, if you fly anywhere. Uh, AU, uh, KDDI, which are our main sponsors, uh, they're actually, they're like the Vodafone of uh, Japan. They're a telecommunications company. So I'm going to show you a couple commercials um, and about how they're using this opportunity to build their brand. And if we can get sound for this one, that would be great. <clears throat> その技術で彼らの夢と挑戦を応援しています。地球から38万キロ離れた月を目指し、世界屈指のロケット打ち上げ基地。お客様、電源を切りいただけますか？お客様、電源を切りいただけますか？お客様、電源を切りいただけますか
but uh, specifically we're focused on water, like many people have said uh, throughout the conference, because water equals uh, fuel, it equals life support, <clears throat> and what we're doing is providing a basically agile, efficient, and economic approach to the next phase of lunar exploration. So we've been working with a number of different people across the world to host scientific payloads. In Tokyo, this is a radiation dosimeter for JAXA. Uh, in uh, Luxembourg, uh, we call this the roving spectrometer project. This is not yet confirmed, but this is the idea. Um, we're working with LIST, which is the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, who are experts in creating mass spectrometers. And if you want to look for hydrogen, mass spectrometers are key. So we're working with them to integrate that into our rover. And finally, also at NASA, we're working with uh, NERVIS, which is a near-infrared spectrometer, again, to put it on our rover and find a better idea of what, what water exists on the moon. Uh, this is my, my final slide. It, it's just about the next phase of lunar exploration and where do we go from here. Uh, so the moon village concept, I think, is a great idea. It's an open concept, and it should be bringing us to a point where we get here. Uh, because as you can see, we are just one small actor in this whole process. And in order to succeed, we really need to work with players from all over the world that can help us with this whole different system uh, that essentially will enable our long-term vision of uh, having more than just this on the moon. This is just the beginning, but having a real community that's on the lunar surface. So I don't think there's going to be any time for questions, but I'll be around after the break. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, is, a, is new to the field of lunar studies. <laughs> it's a joke. Uh, so Bernard Vong from uh, ESA, please. OK, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here at ISU and uh, to report on some ongoing activities and recent activities that we have conducted in the frame of the uh, Moon Village. So uh, I come with the ESTEC angle, which is space research and technology. I have been the elected mayor of STEC staff for five years. Now I'm out of job, so I'm trying to move to the Moon Village. I worked also, um, so de facto, the Moon Village about, is about building a community that will enable the human and robotic sustainable presence on the Moon. And so we have started to build this Moon Village. We started 20 years ago. We founded the International Lunar Exploration Working Group, a body that reports to COSPA, 43 countries, 13 scientific institutions. And with this exchange, we allowed already on real mission to put instruments to share data. And this is what uh, you can see that we, we started with Smart One that we launched in 2003, the little baby of mine with my colleagues, engineers from STEC. But uh, also we had a Kaguya a lander we, uh, the Kangula Orbiter, uh, and we had also Chang'e 1 and 2 that uh, were done by China, but with a strong uh, interaction, bringing knowledge that we had also from the European side, uh, from uh, uh, using our ground station, also our scientific expert. And we had also Chang'e 1 that hosted six international payloads, so already a starter, really, of a moon village in real fact. So, why? Uh, what did we do with this mission? We use them as a, a prospector, as a reconnaissance for the next step. To do science, or to advance scientific knowledge, but also to get knowledge on the environment on the moon that will help us to define better what will be the next step. On processes that shape uh, planets, like uh, tectonics, craters, we, you can uh, get, uh, use the moon as a museum, history museum of the solar system, as uh, Jan mentioned. You have volcanic processes, you have polar region where we have found uh, ice mixed with the soil with a fraction of a few percent. And uh, actually with the smart one, we even created our own impact phenomena as we observe from Earth with a telescope from Canada, France, Hawaii. So um, we have also mapped the dark sides of the moon. There are two dark sides of the moon. They are not on the far side, they are on the poles. There are two uh, areas, 400 square kilometers, where the sun never shines in. And that's the dark side that we need to explore. So the Pink Floyd were right, in, in a sense. And so we have mapped for the first time with Smart One this area over a full season. And then we were able to identify places where you will want 
to a vacation where you want to build the outpost, where you want to build some elements of the moon village. On the near side, at the pole, as you know, the pole is on the far side as well, because two weeks per month, the Earth is below horizon on the pole. So if you want to go both to the far side and the near side, you go to the poles. And from there, you can also explore very interesting areas like Amundsen Crater, where you have uh, some uh, repository of volatiles and so on. With Smart One, we are able to confirm close to the South Pole the presence of a peak of eternal light. It was named by Camille Flammarion. And we found that this place has 90% of the time solar power. So it will be really a fight to get access to this real estate. I hope we do it in a coordinated way. And within the outer space treaty uh, remit, we have to see how not only the first user will uh, use the space, but how we can share these resources for everybody. So we, uh, we found this smart one peak of light. But now, next step, we want to go to the surface. We want to scoop the moon. De facto, we scooped the moon already. Uh, the impact of smart one that we saw, we uh, looked for it for 13 years, and we just found it this year. Using high resolution images, we uh, found the scoop trace of smart one that bounced on the surface of the moon with a trace of 15 meters, and we found some of the ejecta. So now it's uh, really an historical site. I hope the next rover will go and will uh, see the debris, the fragment, to finish this ex experiment. Also with smart one, but also the next uh, mission, Kaguya, we were able to uh, detect uh, lava tube sky light holes. And now, recently, as you have seen, Kaguya with the, around the radar has found that below this, this skylight hole, there are tens of square kilometers of huge lava tube galleries. So you could, go, you could build a moon city. We are even beyond the moon village at this stage. And so that's very interesting places with the moderate temperature variation, possibly even ice in the case. And that's clearly so, so, something that we have to consider also in complementary complementary to the polar area. Now, what else? We found water ice on the moon. With different techniques, from infrared, from neutron spectrometer, you could trace the, the first uh, top one meter. With an impactor, you could find in a plume the presence of water and also organics. So this is changing the whole business for science. Where does it come from? Where, how is it distributed? But also for economy, because you can build life support system, and also uh, water-based economy using the fuel from the moon. And as you know also, rocket from the moon takes 40 times less energy than from Earth. So water from uh, the moon would be a very good consumable that you bring in interplanetary orbit or in, in Earth orbit, for them to maintain the lifetime of our application satellite. Huge market. What is the next phase now? We are entering in what in Illuig we call the Lunar Robotic Village. We announced this concept already 15 years ago, and de facto in 2013, the Chinese have put the first lander as part of this robotic village. It's still in operation after three years, and it also has a telescope that is doing astrophysics from the moon. And with the International Lunar Exploration Working Group, we looked at the roadmap, starting with this precursor. We had the International Lunar Decade, fleet of orbiters, the next one will be a robotic village UK, and then we'll have humans in orbit, and then on the surface that will be working together with robots towards the goal of a sustainable human and robotic presence by 2030. So, Google Lunar Prize, you have heard everything about Google Lunar Prize. I can skip uh, keep the slide. We have worked actually with the Google Lunar Prize team to build the mock-up lander. We built it at, uh, with Illuic and uh, Estec, and we put a telescope on top, and we made some tests observing the moon from Earth, hoping that in the future we'll be able to observe the Earth from the moon with a similar device. And so this is uh, also uh, in order to test the use of telescope to observe the cosmos, but as well to support uh, some uh, operation where you could monitor a rover which is at kilometer distance, like it would be in your uh, front garden. Actually, we had an ISU intern at STEC. Uh, do, doing the teleoperation of this uh, uh, telescope on the lander uh, from an habitat that we have built at ESTEC, simulating a moon base. We use this uh, lander also with a simulation. We found a volcano near the European Astronaut Center that exploded just yesterday on geological timescale, 10,000 years ago. And we brought our equipment there 
testing it with astronaut suits with a rover, looking at what type of operation could be done there in an extreme analog of a volcanic area. We came back actually uh, uh, last year with a, a crew from Superhero, so we have a, a good uh, link with Superhero, International Space University, Free University Amsterdam to provide a mix of students of all disciplines working together on this uh, precursor aspect. So we went there. Now we also were invited to, par to be part of a big campaign in Etna where DLR has tested a, a lander and a very advanced rover. And so with all the team, even with the support at the top of DLR, we were, which were there. And clearly, we are ready to go to the next challenge. So as Professor Vanna has explained, the different ingredients for uh, the Moon Village, I will not uh, paraphrase what he has said. We have some elements already now, the ESA service module uh, that will bring Orion to the Moon and back. That's a strong contribution. But we have been look also looking in service field campaign where you test operation in a confined moon laboratory. We did that in Utah since 2009. We built also such confined habitat in Estec. You can spend uh, a few days there if you want. We, uh, this summer we built a laboratory at Estec, like a module that uh, could be used to um, handle samples that would be brought. Uh, we worked also with um, a postdoc that has been spending one year on Mars in uh, ISIS, and now she's building a Moon and Mars based analog in ZARM, Bremen. And this summer, we have uh, in, in a partnership uh, with a Polish uh, uh, enthusiast, um, we have um, uh, built a Moon and Mars base called Lunares in Poland, where we have conducted teleoperation and we had uh, three crew of astronauts in action. We use this as a platform for them to test the tele-robotic of a lander and rover like we would do on the surface of the Moon from the Deep Space Gateway or from Earth. Life science is important, so we tested how to grow plants out of lunar soil, uh, to have a hydroponic system that could sustain such a habitat. And then I would like to end with other communities that we have like to address. We have worked with a, a various art and art science schools, and you will see outside a number of posters from this uh, um, art Academy on the topic of King of the Moon Village, but uh, we have organized a series of events and um, projects, research projects with some of these artists. One of them is uh, with a community of 20 countries and um, universities all over the world. We are going to perform a global science opera, Moon Village, and there will be, most of the scene has been pre-recorded, but there will be five in real time, including ESTEC. So you are all invited to come at ESTEC or in other locations on the 13th of December to see the world premiere of the Moon Village Global Science Opera. These are some of the costumes from the characters. And uh, we have also done some work with Apprentice in UK, the competition with the Architecture uh, University in Stuttgart. They developed a three month project. Uh, we organized an industry event with Airbus. And last, we also have done some work with the UN and COSPA to try to shape also uh, the preparation of the space capacity. So uh, many sessions, uh, we organize about uh, 15 per year with, with different uh, membership, university, technical, and so on. The next one, our connection. I'll leave that and I thank you for your attention. Very exciting. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Thorsten uh, Kierning from uh, PT Scientists, uh, where he consults on their plans, I believe, for a lunar mission. Okay, outstanding. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Thorsten Kierning from the PT Scientists in, in Berlin, and um, we are here with two people. I also like to point out uh, our head of uh, public outreach and communication, uh, Space Kate, Kate Artless Gray. Um, we are happy to take any questions later on because I'm quite sure I will fill up my 10 minutes here. So, what we want to do is we want to go back to the moon. Hey, that's why we are here. Um, we want to go back to the moon in humanity's best interest. So, we want to go back to a place where humanity has been on the moon already, and that's namely 
the Apollo 17 site. Uh, I will come back to that uh, in a second, where everybody else talked about, hey, we want to explore something what is new. We want to go back where humanity has been and has conducted our science already. So why is it important? I think, uh, especially for the Moon Village and any upcoming uh, settlements, it's important to learn from the past. To set the scene, what motivates us uh, or motivated us to do that, um, here's a short clip. And Carl, you set the scene already. Uh, so let's see how we can film it. I hope you have fun. Space, the final frontier. For generations, we have shared in the excitement of exploring strange new worlds and going where no man has gone before. And yet, many people wonder why we should go there again. My name is Frank Schätzing. I write books about the future. And I would like to show you why our future lies in the stars. Therefore, we have to look at our past. Four billion years ago, DNA evolved in the primeval oceans. Life forms developed, failed, succeeded. Until one chattering ape rose up and started doing what none of the others could, imagining the future. The first pioneer was born. Because with the power to imagine the future came the power to shape it. Pioneers are driven by special genetics. A novelty-seeking gene is built into their DNA that makes them take risks, overcome boundaries, and push humanity forward. Pioneers have unlocked the mysteries of nature, studied the stars, turned our view of the world upside down, and created a mountain of problems for themselves. Because what distinguishes visionaries from the majority is that they see things that others don't see or understand. Today, Galileo's heliocentric model of the solar system and Darwin's theory of evolution are textbook stuff. But they were bitterly contested at the time. Even today, the public opinion often is, visions are fine, as long as they bring instant benefits. But the course of human history has been set precisely by such far-sighted visions. And today, we are about to realize the next one. In 1969, one giant leap for mankind generated global euphoria. But once the space race was won, the mission was accomplished, over and out. Now we need new pioneers that show us the path into the future. Visionaries such as Richard Branson, Google and Audi are driving space travel forward, and they are being criticized too. Don't we have enough problems on Earth that we should solve first? Yes, we do. And that's exactly why space travel is of such an importance. So Audi and the part-time scientists are going on the mission to the moon in humanity's best interest. But why is the moon our next logical step? Let's have a look at it. Ice deposits at both poles can be used to make fuel. Filling stations in space would dramatically reduce the cost of long-range missions to resource-rich planets, for instance. Helium-3 could provide us with clean energy for thousands of years, and on the moon alone there are millions of tons of this stuff. Moon telescopes could expand our knowledge of the universe tremendously, help identify habitable planets and provide an early warning system to avert the greatest of all threats, meteorites, which can be warded off better from the moon. Reasons enough for a team of German engineers to risk a return to our neighboring satellite. In 2009, the part-time scientists came together, inspired by the vision of putting a research vehicle on the moon. The data and images it is to transmit back will provide us with new insights and lay the groundwork for future missions. 
Audi and the part-time scientists have designed a special rover to do just that. The Audi Lunar Quattro. An Audi of truly universal capabilities. A masterpiece of engineering. Equipped with Quattro, e-tron, ultra-lightweight and connectivity technology, the Audi Lunar Quattro is ready for the moon's challenges. Perhaps the car of the future. Not the first time that space technology would enrich in our daily life. Going to the moon makes sense, and it even makes us smarter. Whenever Homo sapiens challenges his intellect, his brain takes a leap forward. Venturing out into new terrain triggers our evolutionary development. The Earth is our home, and so is the cosmos it lies in. Our ancestors were driven by the desire for knowledge, and today we know we live on a fragile, vulnerable island floating in space. The answers lie out there. Thank you. A bit of advertisement at the end. Um, as, you, as we all spoke here about bringing non-space actors into space, that's how it can happen. And thanks, Carl. You mentioned uh, Vodafone. Uh, that's our second big sponsor uh, we have. Vodafone, we will not come to that today, but we'll build the first LTE network on the, on the moon's surface uh, just to test to see how COTS development, uh, how COTS uh, will work there. But what is our mission to the moon? Um, so we want to, and we still believe, we will be the first or one of the first private missions are on the lunar surface. Um, our mission goals is just to show that and going back to Apollo 17, also to show um, the commercialization of space is possible also for smaller actors. So space graded technologies um, will be shown uh, by us and our partners. Partners are not just uh, private entities, they are also agencies like the U uh, European Space Agency, DLR or NASA. Um, but also for the first mission, and it is a series of missions we are talking here about for the upcoming uh, years or decades, two minutes are okay. Um, we have already uh, four and a half, uh, six and a half million dollars, uh, euros um, in commercial clients. So what is the core technology we have? We have, you see two parts here, our spacecraft, oops, sorry. Our spacecraft, Alina, which is able to carry 100 kilogram of payload to the moon's surface. And um, we sell that, uh, this transport uh, to the lunar surface for, and it's on our website, 800,000 euro per kilogram. So you heard yesterday other numbers, uh, I think we are on a very competitive, um, frame there. And we have the Audi Luna Cavadro, which is also can be seen as a mobile experimental platform. Uh, it can carry up to five kilo of payload for experiments. Um, our mission to the moon, um, as um, I mentioned, we want to go back to the to the surface of the moon. And that's the latest commercial of Vodafone, which shows the approach how Alina lands on the moon. It's on the German TV already. And you will see a few more of those and, and with Audi in the upcoming years, uh, or upcoming months. Our destination is Apollo 17, as, as mentioned. And yes, there is uh, immediately the debate about the um, heritage sites. And Kate will give tomorrow a talk um, on behalf of for all moon kinds uh, who try to protect those. So if we go there that close, a question, how can that picture be taken? Correct answer is with the second rover. We go with two rovers there because it's cool. A for redundancy, B never done before, and C they can uh, watch each other and stream that back and give it, yeah, let's say, a human face. Um, we will not touch it. We will go 200 meters. Everything is discussed with, with NASA in close cooperation. Our commercial outlook. So we are heading for launch, and we do have a launch agreement already in place which will launch window 2018, 2019 on a, a Falcon 9 um, together with a, the with a second payload, but we are the prime on that. Um, we go to Apollo 17, Tauro Littro, uh, and then every second year or every 
year we plan new missions uh, in coordination and in prospect for the Moon Village. Um, everything is said about that. Uh, we think we can be an integral part on that. If you have a more um, interest uh, on this mission, we have a few uh, of these brochures with us, or Kate and I are available uh, today and tomorrow for more questions. And that's it. Two minutes. Our next speaker, uh, Bafok, is easier than Bozidov. Bo 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 yeah, it's easier. It's easier to hear it than it is to read it. Yeah. Anyway, please. Thank you. And we have a video as well. Video. Yeah, can I start? Cool. So, hi, my name is Bujidar. And I'm here to represent Space Mining Technologies. We are a startup that uh, formed two months ago only. So we are a bit different than what you heard so far. We are very young in, in our idea. And I'm going to start by, by asking you a question. How many of you like to drink water? Yeah. I guess a lot. And how many of you can survive without water? I, I think some of you also like to wash with water, but maybe not everyone. Then there's this thing, maybe some of you heard of the Moon Village. It's a new concept, maybe, maybe you've heard of it. And, you know, there are astronauts that are going to go there, and they're going to drink water. Or they need to drink water, they need to shower, they need to, um, yeah, they need water for everything just to sustain their life. And also, you know, not only water. Um, so there's a lot of need for that. And we think that we can help in this field. We have calculated through some research uh, and uh, talks with uh, astronauts that currently the ISS with six astronauts there per year needs this amount of liters of water. And maybe you know how expensive it is to bring stuff from Earth to the moon. This is the, this is the average price currently on the market. As PT scientists just said, they're a bit more competitive. So you can uh, scratch it and write uh, 800,000, right? <laughs> That's what you said. Um, we believe we can reduce this to this by bringing water directly, well, producing water directly on the moon. How are we gonna do that? There are ice deposits, as many of you know, most probably, you've heard of it already. Um, especially on the, on, the, uh, on the south and north pole, there are a lot of ice deposits. And we want to extract them using simple technology with microwaves. And we were supposed to have a table here, but uh, you can see it there, right, to my, right next to my colleague, Pasha. We have our first prototype that can extract here on Earth, unfortunately. We still haven't uh, uh, validated the concept on the moon, but soon, soon. We want to do that and extract water directly from the ice. And one of my colleagues, Patrick, he has a very good talent in drawing, as you can see. He drew this when he was three years old. He already had the idea in his mind. Well, I'm kidding, he drew it yesterday. But <laughs> the idea is we have a, a big tank that will store the water and a fleet of small, small harvesters that can, is this working? No, okay. So a fleet of small harvesters that uh, extract the water and deliver it to the tank. Afterwards, we deliver it to the moon base, moon village, tourist center, maybe Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos are, are listening, I don't know, hopefully. And I'm gonna show you a video of our prototype 
in action. Um, but first, I, I really want to stress out that two months ago, we didn't know each other. We are a team of six, we, we, you'll see afterwards, but in just two months, we focused on technology. As Jan said yesterday, there are a lot of people who just speak in the space industry. We want to work, we want to focus on, on our passion. Because for two months, yeah, we don't have um, uh, investment, we don't have uh, uh, capabilities to deliver uh, crazy uh, videos narrated by external consultants, etc. But we have technology and style. So this is Regolith, our, our Regolith that we brought from the moon, wink wink. This is a hundred times slower than actually, but it takes a few minutes. So currently we are, so this is our timeline for the next couple of years, short and midterm uh, plans. Uh, we are currently at TRL3. TR we just have uh, proof of concept of the science and the technology. What we are aiming for is to have TRL6 by, by uh, 2019, which means we will have um, demonstration on lunar simulated environment here on Earth with the actual spacecraft and harvester. Um, to reach that, of course, we need support, investment, and uh, yeah, I believe exposure. So tweet, please tweet. Long-term plans: we aim to have proof of concept on the moon, to have the first drop of water on the moon by 2021. 2026, we want to to launch the whole system with the tank and the harvesters. And three years later, we want to launch a second version that will be able to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen and, uh, of, of the water and to use that for rocket propellant. And of course, we plan to triple the capacity of the tanker by then. These are our predicted uh, costs and uh, revenues. As you can see, uh, so this is number of years. On the ninth year, starting from now, we will plan to, to launch our system. On the 13th year, we plan to launch a second version. And uh, yeah, coincidentally, it matches the Moon Village. Oh, yeah. It matches the Moon Village plans. This is my team, and uh, I'm just a business person. I'm a simple man. But all the others are engineers. They are the brains behind that. And they are very passionate, we all are, to bring water to the Moon or to harvest it there. So this is my presentation and as final words, I asked, well, at the beginning I asked you how many of you like to drink water? Now I'm gonna ask you how many of you would like to drink moon water? Someday maybe you'll be, we'll be able to do that. So here's to the moon village and here's to water. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Okay, do we have questions? Go. The mass. So we are aiming for the first concept that we, that we want to bring by 29, uh, 2021, sorry, uh, for the proof of concept to be less than three kilos. Um, for the whole system, we still don't know. It depends on uh, a lot of things, mainly 
on whether uh, we have to bring solar panels from Earth or some companies are already working on building solar panels there. We have calculated that to, to um, harvest um, 5,000, I believe it was, waters, uh, liters of water, sorry, uh, we need about 32 square meters of uh, um, solar panels. Yeah, thank you. Our next presentation uh, is from um, uh, Professor uh, Tai Sik Lee of uh, Hanyang uh, University, who is, uh, has promised not to show the 40 slides, but only a small fraction of them. Please, Dr. Lee, thank you. Actually, I have the 32, so a minute I'll try to fast. Um, kind of technologies, ISRU, uh, for the moon village construction. I already have the uh, construction company. The name is Moon X Construction. I will explain later. Uh, this is my resume. Don't, don't look at this too much. But the first part is a president of KIST, Korean Institute of Civil Engineering Building Technology which is 1,000 researchers, including 400 PhD. Uh, they will have that the uh, Moon and Mars uh, environment vacuum chamber, uh, size-wise 4 meter by 4 meter by 4 meter, 50 cubic meter. We call not clean vacuum chamber, we call dirty vacuum chamber, because there are the uh, moon soil and then moon dust inside the vacuum chamber, very difficult. But for, for the construction test, uh, 10 minus 8 tor and minus 100, uh, 170 plus 150 and also uh, radiation uh, day and night, you can test it. So a uh, committee from the NASA, committee from ESA, committee from Canada, we have the uh, vacuum chamber committee. So you can use it within one year. So. Uh, whether we like it or not, but uh, Don Trump and then fans, vice president of the United States decide to go to the moon again with uh, mankind. That is very important for the uh, moon village people like us. Um, skip it. We went to the um, NASA Sentinel Challenge and then I had an interview with uh, NASA. The reason is uh, not only the space construction, but also us construction, we can use that ISLU because uh, basalt from the volcano is free. I mean, the volcano ashes is free. And also, the as you bind the polymer, as the polyethylene is garbage on the uh, island, on the, on the sea. So we can use the $3,000 for four people housing. Not the, not the American, not the Europe, not the Korea, but also developing country like the shelter. Very important. And you know this one. And then institute construction is one of my special area, but the ISRU, if I have a time, I can speak the eight hours. But you can see here, you can see here the resource and also the manufacturing, and then consumer production, and then resource acquisition institute, and including the energy. That's, I call the smart city on the moon. So you can see that later, you can see many things, not only food, water, and the mining and energy, you cover the, uh, this afternoon. And then construction is very important because now we are talking about uh, mankind living on the moon and Mars. The, uh, the living on the moon is living in the uh, nuclear power plant silo, a lot of radiation you cannot endure. So we can use it lava tube instead of uh, the, uh, above the ground. So this is a technology map. 
This is just something to challenge the video. You can use it to recyclable items as a binder, and then you can use it the transportation cost from the Earth to the Moon is a 1.2 million dollars per kilogram. So I'll skip it. This is very important. You can see that the 10 point is here is all the crushed basaltic igneous rock and all basalt and then recyclable items is important uh, low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene this is uh, all recyclable food from the wrapping of the oil uh, cargo from uh, from the earth to the moon very important so this one is very important we uh, we win against the first ten partners the second stage, the this and moon X construction of Seoul is my team. And then we won the, out of the 77 teams uh, for making this these uh, beams, basalt and uh, uh, polymer. I don't have time. So one of the point is here, but I can not show. So I assure you, uh, I'm strongly recommend very important topics and the wish to research and development. You can see that uh, uh, similar to the, here, we, we can copy the lunar mask. Uh, this is Korean uh, lunar simulant and then structure members and then the entry landing pad and the rover and then construction system and then vacuum chamber. Mine is a two meter by two meter and then a dirty vacuum chamber. So I said we can we uh, processing every the research area the vacuum chambers. This is two meter by two meter, and then 3D printer you can see it. I spent uh, 25 million dollars. So this one is very important. Um, NASA has the SBIR and STTR for the small business and also. National Science Foundation has the also SBR and SCTTR. So we are making the ISRU system test for the uh, radiation shielding, and then we can test it on the moon. I got the offer five kilogram of the uh, lander. The problem is that six million dollars we need. So this is a Jack Schmidt uh, laptop, and then the Rob, and then John Hamilton is my friend, and then Dave Miller from the NASA, and then uh, Bojo Aldrin is my mentor. And you can see the Hank Rogers is here. He used uh, my term the from uh, Apollo 11. The NASA uh, average the engineer's age is 26 old years. Later, I will explain the emphasize in the high school later. And then Jan is here, and Bernard is here, and then Bob Richard. So this is a 300 uh, the college and high school in Korea. They are ready for the you know study and the research for the moon and Mars. And ISU, ISU has a good program for the graduates program, but not for the undergraduate, not for the high school. So next page is very important, LCAT. We got the um, STEAM project from NASA and the $1.2 million for the high school students. So we do this program, we'll make that young guys. Nowadays, you, you can look around, we are very mature, and then far side, maybe the students are there, but the, for the moon village, we need young, young scholars and then researchers and then students. So LCAT is a basically program is a lava tube. We test it on the lava tube on the earth and how can we survive? How can we uh, make that uh, building uh, shelters? So this is important. I will explain about this one. And next uh, year, March 6 to 7, we'll have the Back to the Moon workshop after this workshop. And 
Nowadays, we uh, invited many uh, VIP as an organizing committee here. I'm officially invite all of you to come to Korea March 6th to 7th. Just before we have the Winter Olympic game in February. So you can enjoy the February Winter Olympic game and then come to workshop. Thank you so much. I have a brochure for the 3D printer. This one, uh, the transportation cost from Korea to the uh, America, $500,000, 400 kilogram. So how can we make the from 400 kilogram to the five kilogram? That is uh, next to my job. And also this one is uh, pamphlet for next year. And then this is uh, for ICD. I may have one question time. So I believe uh, there's a typographical error in the program. Uh, so I was told, and I believe I think the next speaker should be Michael Mealing. Uh, who is the CEO of Waypaper? Yes. Welcome. Hey. Hi everyone. Uh, this is actually great because the last time I was at a lunar specific conference was the old uh, moon society conference in the mid 2000s um, it took that long to get this going again so i'm happy to see this many people interested in the moon um, so i am i have three titles that i'm kind of here representing the first is the ceo of the wayfaver foundation which is a nonprofit that i think a few uh, members here have been to some of our previous meetings uh, out in silicon valley and uh, the Wayfarer Foundation's goal is to remove the obstacles for human lunar settlement. Um, my other job title is also the CEO or the president of the Moon Society, which is a very old, uh, slightly defunct um, interest organization that uh, Wayfarer is currently rebooting. Um, the yes, the third. Um, job title I have is my day job, the thing that actually pays me, which is I am also the COO of a space-oriented venture capital fund, Starbridge Venture Capital. So I am here as also a capacity for looking for deals and looking for investors. So in some of the economic modeling work that uh, we've been doing the last few days in some of the workshops, um, I've been providing some of the, the, the insight into how venture capital works. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a dive into what Wayfaver is currently working on, um, and then a little bit into um, how uh, the Moon Society has a, plays a role in this. So historically, some of the things that Wayfarer has done is uh, raised money from some wealthy families in the U.S. who wanted to be able to facilitate human lunar settlement. From some of that money, we uh, commissioned Maiden Space to do a habitat study uh, with the idea of creating a, uh, a lunar uh, exploration simulation in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, that has not happened, but we do have the, the, the base reference uh, mission architecture for the actual base itself that Maiden Space uh, did for us. We also have something called the Lunar Settlement Index. That is our database that's on our website for the identified obstacles that we have seen in the marketplace and both technically and financially um, and the things that we are using to decide what to work on when the money comes in for us to be able to fund that work. What we're working on now, um, so I, I came on board to the Wayfarer uh, about uh, six months ago. And so I went out to my colleagues in the industry to kind of get a, an idea of what was going on in, in the cis lunar industry and what was preventing us. And the consensus that I heard was the technical challenges we have a handle on. It's the political, financial, and regulatory challenges that are presenting a lot of issues for companies and, and organizations to be able to build the things they need to build. And we felt that the, the highest impact that we could provide was actually solving some of the economic analysis, providing input both to regulators, policymakers, and companies to determine uh, business models that close, uh, technologies that may need to reduce costs, and any regulatory changes. So what we're actually doing is doing, building something called an agent-based model, 
you could think of it as a sim city for building a moon base, but on the economic side. Uh, so we're lo looking for a lot of data on the core pieces, for example, con uh, transportation costs, different options for different transportation in infrastructures, and putting that into a model where we can actually simulate the individual actors in that supply chain and do things to them, such as if you've ever played SimCity, have the Godzilla come in the middle and destroy your city. We do things like what happens if you have a recession in the middle of trying to build a cislunar infrastructure and now capital is no longer available as much as you thought it was. Those things represent risks to companies deciding when and how they actually want to go into business. There are several different organizations that we are aware of within the U.S. that are doing something similar to, similar to this, and we've all sort of identified a couple of problems preventing us from getting to that high-fidelity model. The first one is just finding the data. There's a lot of data that is either old, um, the surveys are out of date, or the technologies and the underlying assumptions have changed enough that we need to get some high-fidelity market demand data, cost data, and, and some of the component infrastructure uh, notional costs. We're putting all of that into a supply chain model for the different actors in the supply chains, the, mo the things that motivate them, and then using that as a basis for being able to see whether or not we can close certain business cases and what conditions allow those business cases to close. So that's Waypaper. One of Waypaper's projects is adopting the Moon Society and bringing it back up to being the advocacy organization that um, it always wanted to be and tried to be. The Moon Society's really job is to be the place that someone who is a layperson, a fan, an enthusiast, um, my father uh, would love to go to the moon, does, is not an aerospace engineer, would not understand most of the things that we're talking about today, but he wants to be involved. So we're taking moon, the, the Moon Society and kind of rebooting it to be able to be that kind of organization. So we, it's a, a relationship between the two organizations is symbiotic. The Moon Society is a place that we can go out and raise, a lot, raise money from people that are interested in being involved but can't. And then Waypaper takes that money and be able to funnel it directly into the things that we identify have the most impact. So that's what Waypaper and Moon Society are. Um, one of the things that, that the reason that I'm also the COO of a venture capital fund is everything we're doing here becomes my company's deal flow. So if you have a space project that you're looking for funding for and you think it fits in a 10-year venture capital time horizon, please come talk to me. Any questions? Did I get, it, get us back on time? Awesome. Uh, our next scheduled speaker is Stefan DeMay from the European Space Agency. And, and I don't know, uh, I'll just say it uh, uh, as he's coming down. I, personally am just thrilled at the diversity and the depth of and the, the, uh, the, the, the real uh, uh, array of speakers that we've had so far today. I just, I think it really is a tribute to the, the level of international interest in the moon. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Stéphane Demay. I'm from the European Space Agency and the Strategic Planning Office of uh, the Directorate of Human Space Flight and Robotic Exploration. Maybe the most important thing you need to know of me is that uh, I started uh, at ESA where Giuseppe was my uh, lord and master. So I'm feeling a tremendous pressure in keeping the time now. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll talk you through three um, uh, topics. The, the exploration strategy we have, uh, our new program, E3P, and then I'll focus a bit on, on the moon activities in that program. Why explore? This question has been answered by our member states' ministers in 2014, where they established uh, our ESA exploration strategy. And, okay, we want to explore, we want to live and work in space, but as an underlying um, or overarching um, team, we want to bring benefits to society. 
in four domains, in, in knowledge, economy, innovation, um, in inspiration, and global partnerships. Um, that, that is explained in this slide, and I put also inform, innovate, inspire, interact, uh, showing that this nicely falls together with um, our Space 4.0, four eyes strategy of our Director General. Partnerships, global partnerships is one of the pillars, and this um, picture is from uh, ISEC-G, the um, International Space Exploration Coordination Group, um, is from the 2013 version, we're working on, on an update. Um, here you see the moon in the center, a bit little maybe, but uh, in the new version I think um, this will get a growing role. Here it's a step towards Mars, uh, I think there is an evolution where it goes more also as a destination in its own right. Um, so, to be followed. By the end of the year, we come with, with the new version. This is the strategy we have. Um, that has been translated into a program, uh, the, the European Exploration Envelope Program. And this is uh, decided by our ministers at the end of 2016. Um, and in the middle of this list, an open-ended program integrating existing and new ESA exploration activities. This is very important. For the first time at ESA, we do have an integrated program that brings together all exploration activities. It allows us to put a vision in our activities and to do a long-term planning. Um, it aims at delivering our strategy, obviously. It's aligned with Space 4.0, as I mentioned. Um, it's about humans and robotics in an integrated way. Um, it goes to all destinations, Leo, Moon, Mars. Um, and it's internationally coordinated. In the first period, which is running now from 2016 until 2019, um, there is not a, a big um, um, difference with what has been done before. It's a continuity, um, but we bring all programs together. And this is the lineup of the missions we have uh, in the coming years. Those are the real missions which are in work and which will be executed. And ISS, of course, is a continuity of activities, a lot of research. For the moon, we go to the lunar vicinity with uh, the exploration missions where we provide um, our contribution to Orion um, with the service module. This has been explained uh, in extenso this morning. And for Mars, we had 2016 our TGO and uh, our lander. And in 2020, we will continue with, uh, with our rover um, with the ExoMars 2020. Those are our missions, but the program is more than the missions. We also have um, activities, transversal activities that support our future evolution. This is our roadmap, which we try to use to define the future missions. And here on the uh, left-hand side, you see our current missions, the ISS, Orion, uh, Lunar Resource, and ExoMars. Um, on the right, this is where we want to go in the long term. Um, we want to move from ISS to exploitation of LEO platforms. We don't want to abandon LEO, but we will do it in a different way. And, and the errors indicate the options how to go from left to right. So ISS there might be an extension, um, but in the long term, we will come to commercial LEO. And probably we could also cooperate, for instance, with China. Orion um, will evolve and we'll, we come to a deep space gateway um, and this will help us in early human missions beyond LEO. For the moon, currently we have the lunar resource missions with Roscosmos. Um, we're looking into demonstration missions to come to human lunar exploration. And then there is Mars where a candidate uh, for future exploration is the Mars sample return mission. Uh, and this is really the horizon goal uh, in, the, in the far future, the human exploration of Mars. Focus on the moon. You saw it already in the lineup of the missions, uh, the lunar resource missions. Um, here we contribute two major payloads, pilot for the landing and prospect for prospecting um, the, the resources on the moon. Um, we heard it already uh, many times. Prospecting is a very important initial step. Uh, we need to know and we need to increase our knowledge before we can uh, think about using uh, what is on the moon. 
I would skip this one. ESM, a uh, very uh, important uh, step for Europe. It's really bringing Europe uh, into um, exploration beyond uh, low, low Earth orbit. We're very proud we can, we can contribute to that. The Deep Space Gateway, um, just why is it so important? Um, it addresses key challenges. Uh, it has been explained this morning, high power electric propulsion, um, radio, bi radio biological uh, protection, uh, life support systems, uh, logistics, uh, plenty of opportunities. It's a springboard to Mars, but more than that, in first instance, um, it brings us a lot of um, new technologies and, and capabilities. Now we, we are a bit in the future already, and in, in, in options for future program elements, a deep space gateway obviously needs to be decided. It's under study, but it needs to be decided. This is another one. Um, in the 2025 time frame, and here we come a bit in competition with uh, one of the previous speakers. Uh, we put a goal for this mission to produce drinkable water, breathable oxygen, by 2025. It's four years after my previous speaker, uh, with an industrial procurement budget below 250 million euros. This is a very innovative mission for ESA, not only the content technology, but also the procurement, because we want to do it through commercial procurement of a lender service, commercial procurement of the communication services, and then the payload. Okay, we start looking into it in a classical way, but we will also in parallel try to see if through innovation exchanges with industry and maybe also the non-space industry, we can get also the payload um, done together with non-space. Very interesting and we, we're learning. Then a bit further in time, in the 2030, there is um, a precursor uh, for human lunar exploration. Uh, our Japanese colleague already presented it as the Heracles mission. Um, this is a demonstration mission, which will be uh, one of the first uh, big customers of, of the Deep Space Gateway uh, and SLS. Um, it aims to demonstrate end-to-end uh, -end a human mission scenario using the Deep Space Gateway. Um, and as I said, uh, in cooperation with uh, JAXA and also with the Canadian Space Agency. And of course, NASA for the interface with the Deep Space Gateway. Uh, and then th that's my la last slide. Um, at ESA, we really are serious about um, trying to get commercial uh, services um, as, a, as a model for our future activities. We do have on the space station a first commercial service, Ice Cubes, which will be uh, going live uh, early next year. Um, we also have some lunar services in the pipeline, um, namely one of PTS, uh, where we have commercial partnership to help them uh, and for them to help us to do our missions uh, in terms of lunar landers. Uh, we have another one with um, SSDL for the telecommunication and navigation services. And actually, this is my last slide. Um, my first slide was about bringing benefits uh, to society. And as an integral part of our E3P program, uh, we introduce now at ESA Exploration um, uh, a management approach to incorporate benefit management as an integral part of our program. Um, thank you very much. Questions? Actually, we, we're running a grant, or we will run a ground demonstration um, project, uh, which will start very soon. Uh, we actually um, closed an invitation to tender um, for working with uh, academia and with industry to find out which process, wh what were, for the time being, the we don't have pinpointed a location nor a process. It could be from Regolith um, on the moon, could be also from the poles for, from volatiles. This is, this is not yet uh, decided. And actually, we, we will run several studies in parallel, um, keeping all options open for the time being.
Our next speaker is uh, uh, Tibor uh, Pasher, uh, who will be uh, uh, speaking to us, I think, about Team uh, Puli or Pulai, Puli, uh, Hungary's first private lunar mission team. Please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, John, and uh, I'm very happy to be here, and it's a great honor for us as a kind of underdog uh, between the, the bigger stuff. Uh, and I would like just to tell you what we are doing, what we have been doing the last uh, couple of years, and what we may contribute uh, to the Moon Village. Okay, so we just uh, figured out during the years that, uh, like uh, Tsiolkovsky said, if you want to go out of the cradle, then you have to be able also mobile after getting somewhere. So we are concentrating actually on a special type of mobility, which is, uh, uh, for somebody maybe a uh, known notion, it's the VEG concept, is a wheel and the leg combination. This is what you can see on, on this uh, picture as well. So we are able to use actually the advantages of the leg and also the, the wheel. So we are able to go about 35 uh, degrees uh, slopes. Uh, we are able to go over pretty big uh, obstacles as well. I will show some images on that well. So this is our uh, motto actually, how can we uh, go over router ends uh, under extreme conditions as well. So uh, actually I would like to go use just uh, this or vision that's uh, which is a kind of uh, historical attempt to get Hungary to the moon. Uh, some of you may be heard that uh, Hungarians are actually Martians. In Los Alamos it was declared by a couple of people, so uh, we have a national, uh, natural tendency to go out into space and the first step would be the moon. So it would be, I believe, a historical uh, step just for a small country like Hungary to get uh, this uh, feasible. Uh, I would like just to show you that uh, we don't have actually much money, it's a completely or almost all volunteer team and our biggest uh, uh, asset is actually the around 70 up to 80,000 volunteer hours we just put into the project. It's just my uh, guys, uh, the group leaders, we have about 20 active uh, members and during the years we were on 140, 150 people just working on the project. Some came and some gone also very quickly. So what we did actually, uh, we uh, went, uh, we, we, we did three uh, pretty big analog field tests or analog planetary research if you like. So that means that we tested our uh, prototypes in various um, environments. The first one was actually in 2013 in the Moroccan desert in cooperation with the Austrian Space Forum. They are doing a great job actually in analog planetary research. There will be a next big uh, field test for them uh, 2018 in Oman, a four-week big stop. Unfortunately, we will not be there, but uh, it was the first uh, thing in, in Morocco, and actually we used it to uh, make a proof of concept that our mobility concept is working, that our communication concept is working, and we controlled the rover from Budapest, having built a communication chain. You can see this, this image. We are working also with the analog astronauts of uh, the Austrian Space Forum, and this will be on the third field test uh, uh, result. This is just to show that uh, we, were, we were there. We could control the craft uh, or spacecraft uh, or robot rover there, and this was quite a good success. Uh, this is what we see have seen from the Moroccan desert uh, by the eyes of the rover. This is actually the classical control of rovers. Uh, we take pictures, images, uh, get it back, analyze in the uh, mission control and make the new movement, actually. So the next big test was in Hawaii. Uh, Hank uh, mentioned the PISES, the Pacific International System of Exploration Systems. I just uh, uh, tried to get it uh, right. And we were one of the first uh, customers, if you like, on, on PISES in the High Wahine Valley. Uh, and we did a simulation of, of the Google Lunar X Prize. And this is the time maybe just to mention that we were born actually also as a team for the Google Lunar X Prize. Right now we are not uh, in the competition anymore. Uh, it's a longer story. If you want to hear it, then we can uh, discuss this in the meantime. So there we uh, just uh, simulated actually what uh, the Google Lunar X Prize mission uh, participants should deliver. That means that cover at least 500 meters uh, uh, 
make images and videos. And uh, on the lower part, you see one of the first selfies we did in the High Wahine Valley. It was uh, uh, not 130, 60 degrees panorama because behind us was just uh, the slope, so we couldn't, uh, we didn't have any, any reason to do that. We did it, we have analyzed before the area uh, using uh, Google images. Actually, it's the same as if we would like to use some Kaguya or uh, LRO images, and uh, this was the second success uh, for us. Just we learned a lot how to operate the robot, uh, the rover from Budapest, actually. So, with the team, this is like we had actually two prototypes there. So, we uh, had a play as well on the last day that we had controlled two rovers at the same time with the same uh, the two teams actually in the, the mission control. So, our mission control software is also able to cover many or more uh, stuff. And this is uh, just an image, uh, uh, how can we uh, clear obstacles? Of course, we can go uh, uh, around as well. It was just uh, to show that we can climb over that. The third one was actually in, uh, in a rock, rocky glacier uh, close to Innsbruck in the Alps, again with our Austrian Space Forum colleagues. And here we just uh, made a first attempt, how can uh, such a rover help astronauts uh, uh, in field work? So that means that we have been able to over some areas uh, which would it could be dangerous for astronauts not to go there, or we have found some interesting sample and uh, told us that, hey, come here, here's something interesting you can just pick up. Uh, we had also an unintended test uh, in, in this way. Uh, sometime uh, just uh, we got a uh, news from the colleagues uh, uh, in the mission control from Innsbruck that, oh, guys, that's happened something. Your rover is not there where we expect it to be. And in this image, you can. Oh, this does not work. So you can see this is about 20 meters distance. This is what uh, our rover just uh, went down unintentionally. It was uh, uh, just uh, several uh, things which came together. This is the last image we recovered after the accident, actually. So you can see that uh, our rover was already a little bit in a strange situation, and this is actually what we got after. So this is the small uh, stuff what we got. Of course, uh, we, we lost uh, antennas and whatever, but uh, after uh, the colleagues uh, get the rover back to the mission control, or the main base actually, we could just make a reboot uh, from Budapest. So that means that uh, we didn't intend to do this, but it was uh, quite a good test because uh, it showed us that the mechanical construction is quite, quite fine. Okay, so what we would like to do is actually in the future, uh, to build small uh, rover platform uh, using this, uh, I believe that's a pretty unique mobility uh, capabilities, uh, wheels and legs. Um, and uh, we are looking also for solutions, uh, what can we use on Earth. Uh, one example would be just uh, to make a map of uh, landmine uh, stuff. It is the same task actual what we have to do on the moon uh, map uh, area. Uh, we think we can, uh, we, are, we are trying to use as many uh, cots uh, as, as many we can. And uh, next step would be, I tell you it immediately, it will depend on our financing capability, which is not very good. So uh, even if we try to sell uh, uh, logos, uh, the place for the logos, we are not so successful like uh, part-time scientists or Hakuto but we uh, will do that as well. But uh, nevertheless, we have a contract with Astrobotic, also a, a former Google Analytics Spice contestant, uh, to go with them uh, and currently planned end of 19 with an Atlas V ULA uh, rocket to the moon. Uh, and again, uh, we would like to get something there which is already maybe uh, could be a part of the moon village, not only our rover, but also the mom on the moon, this is not my mom or your mom, this memory of mankind, it's a very special time capsule project uh, conducted in uh, Austria. And uh, we will, uh, we'd like to take some very ancient type of uh, uh, data uh, stuff, which is uh, clay tables. It's a very interesting project, I can tell you more in the details. And something which we think it could be a good uh, uh, aspect uh, to make some uh, fun thing on the moon, uh, just make a rover race. Uh, some people already told about that, and uh, the, this uh, could be, if you like, a Lunar Grand Prix, whatever, on the moon. And what we would like to do, uh, the first step uh, next year, just to make a simulation with similar uh, conditions like on the moon, so restricted communication abilities, use the same stuff uh, um, in a quarry, an undesert quarry close to Budapest, 
We think this would be fun as well, just to see that one. And this is also part of our outreach activities from kindergarten kids to uh, retired people. So this is pulley, and I believe we can just uh, uh, do a couple of things for the Mondovich. Thank you. Uh, and Giuseppe just told me that I will be the Moon Village Association coordinator in Hungary and maybe in the countries around where we have also some Hungarian minorities. So I'm, I'm asking now the folks in audiovisual, do we have Maria uh, Grulik ready to go? Our next uh, presentation is uh, is remote. We are sorry we're a little late. It's fine. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> okay, so welcome from my side. Hope you can see me. So you have uh, ten minutes. Great. Okay. Uh, um, I'm presenting as they see today, and as the generation of council. And shortly what we do, so we are uh, organizing global regional national events and also in parallel some uh, project working groups uh, which are working year round uh, on interesting topics for future space leaders. And uh, yes, we are like kind of a networking community and uh, like also we have a lot of scholarships uh, to attend our events. So please look at our website if you're interested. And um, yeah, so one of our activities is also the Space Generation Congress, so the, actually the biggest one. And this year it was held in Adelaide in Australia in conjunction with the ISC. And we had over 150 delegates from 35 countries. And we had high level speakers and subject matter experts of our four of our five working groups with different uh, key issues of current space industry. And one of them was the Moon Village. And uh, I would like to um, present you today the results of this working group. Um, so this is the working group. We had 27 delegates from 19 different countries. And we were kindly sponsored uh, by ESA. And we also have some uh, key experts, uh, such as Carl, who already presented for you today. And uh, here uh, was also another Moon Village workshop earlier this year in Turin, um, held together in conjunction with the ISC Symposium on the Future Space of Exploration towards the Moon Village and beyond. And now I'm coming to the results. So we only not have like a key um, topic, we also have key questions that we are addressing and we're trying to find recommendations for this. And first of all was who are the key players and how can we engage this also hopefully non-traditional space players to be part of the Moon Village vision. And we as a group came to the conclusion that these are the, um, the current uh, stakeholders that we want to address, which is decision makers, investors, and also non-space businesses, and also every one of you in the society. And here you can also see uh, key players for commercialization of the Moon Village, which includes also tourism, transportation, energy, mining, and data storage, which we all would like to um, get engaged for the Moon Village. We came up with a roadmap for engagement, how we can engage them. So for a short term, so five to 10 years, we think it's important that you start with lobbying and uh, building a network and building up who's interested in uh, defining user stake stakeholder groups, which we already do right now with the Moon Village Connection Working Group. So this is uh, very good. And uh, we want to show uh, the kind of business uh, opportunities that you can have on the moon. And also, for com uh, it's very important to have communication in the kind of a global vision. Um, so we need outreach and marketing campaigns uh, to get more people involved for the Moon Village. In midterm, we think it's important to provide a kind of infrastructure for the investors on the moon um, so that after we have uh, figured out what our stakeholders are, what they would like to have, what kind of uh, combined infrastructure we might need. Uh, so we can also, in case it's meant, uh, create a kind of environment to be established varieties of jobs. So kind of uh, that everyone can be involved in this. And we need a continuous public engagement. For long term, if we choose to have it meant, would be the uh, permanent uh, settlement and also to have established space tourism and exploit the moon as a springboard. So developing new technologies and test them on the moon. 
And also, I just heard with the uh, robot race, I'm definitely in for that. We also thought that this might be very interesting um, for people uh, in the future to have some kind of robot fight and engage society. You might have some also Moon TV or um, Earth TV, depending where you live at the moment. And how do you inspire and enable international partnership? So um, the recommendation that we agreed on is a kind of an initiative to the Moon Village Connection Group, which was already established so when we hold this workshop, which was still not the case, it was just the beginning, um, to make the stakeholder goals and also kind of figure out the legal frameworks that we need to address um, to be able to start Moon Village. Um, and next one, recommendations. Uh, second one is um, communicate the Moon Village and the opportunities and benefits with a wider audience because we think it's an international um, endeavor and we can only do it with international partnership. And uh, so we have to ask everyone uh, in the world who would like to participate in that and get to the most people interested in uh, supporting the Moon Village. An example for this is also the mining industry. Or, and um, yeah, so then the third question is um, how might we create a global moon village awareness movement in order to collaborate uh, the moon village concept? And we were thinking that it is very important um, to have a kind of um, a very clear goal defined and also um, like because then we can relate to concrete objects simpler and easier if you have some objectives defined. And how do you want to do this? How do you want to communicate? So we think we want to uh, include professional marketing agencies, which can help lead the awareness movement strategy. And as an example, we use the Rosetta from ESA. It was a very successful mission, also because it was given to external marketing company. And this is the most common and known mission of ESA um, so far. And we think this is what we also need for the Moon Village. Which are the near to midterm goals that uh, we think um, might be needed for the moon village? Uh, um, first, we made some assumptions so that we transportation to the moon is possible, that there are some standards, modular ways of connecting, so the payloads and electronic support systems, so and then uh, economic incentives for lunar commercial activities is also there. And in order to do this, we need a kind of a common infrastructure, especially for power and data. So when you want to develop your payload, you can already connect. Uh, to power on the moon so that you don't have to bring it all the time with you, which would uh, decrease the risk and also costs. And uh, would also um, help developing countries to be part of the moon village journey. Then we want to have like a test bed, uh, offering environment for companies, labs and universities to conduct their research. And therefore it would also be very good if you already have the facility available and kind of that everyone can just plug in their payloads that they need and uh, don't have to develop everything from scratch all the time new. And downstream application of this would also be then lunar tourism. And how can space agencies facilitate this and how boost development? So we came to the conclusion that uh, the space agencies um, have the role of uh, like leading the community and uh, in this sense that they have a kind of a clear direction and narrative a bit down of this very open concept. And that also we need a kind of organization coordinate uh, the development, lead the community towards the goal. Um, but I think we already with the Moon Village Nation Working Group, we are on the good way um, with this recommendation. Uh, yeah, so also we, they have to be, um, develop the building blocks that are required for the Moon Village, so support the development of particular technologies and the urban architecture and kind of uh, what is uh, already taking place with ESA. They have business incubators uh, for startups and we can make this as well for Moon Village startups so that we can um, encourage uh, innovation and new businesses uh, and help them to grow, give them the network that they need. Um, to start everything and um, help them uh, to be part of the Moon Village community. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention and uh, make the mood great again. So if, uh, if you have questions, uh, you, can, uh, oops, sorry, you can contact me on uh, my email address and uh, yeah, I'm open for questions. So we have time for one question. If you can, if you can stay, Maria, for just a moment. Yes, sure. Any questions? 
Oh, uh, uh, what, please read your uh, full email. It's a little covered up by the, by the camera. Ah, it's uh, maria.grulich at spacegeneration.org. So, generation.org. Yes. There it is. There it is. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay, so after all of that, we ended up just about uh, 10 minutes behind schedule. So not too bad. Please uh, give me just a moment. So, having uh, sat and uh, spent the last couple of hours uh, listening to some really wonderful talks, both from uh, major industry and from major space agencies and from uh, startup companies and uh, uh, players from around the world, uh, now we get to uh, take the opportunity of the next couple of hours uh, to do some of the work that Giuseppe said we were here to do when he made his introductory remarks uh, last night and uh, this morning. So we have a um, two hours scheduled for the breakout sessions. We have a tight uh, fixed uh, requirement to be back in here for a few minutes starting at 1630 for three more um, uh, technical presentations uh, by people who are remote and at uh, very uh, exotic uh, times. So it's very challenging for them. Uh, so that'll be from uh, starting at 16.30 and going through 17.15. And then we will break up again and go back into the breakout sessions for a little bit longer. So let me take a few minutes and give you an overview of the, of the breakout sessions. So this, this, uh, um, these slides, which are available in the breakout sessions from the rapporteurs, uh, are the overview and the training on what will the what will be done? How is the organization of the breakout working sessions this afternoon, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow afternoon? Uh, the core tool uh, to make sure that we capture your issues, the items that you think really need to be raised and elevated in the final report from this workshop, uh, are, is a thing which uh, I've used many times in the past called an ITBC. If you have never used it, you should, because they're very useful. It basically just means an issue or an item to be considered. And it comes from a, a legacy from a Deep Space Network documentation called the PFR, a Problem Failure Report. Back when I started at NASA, it was in the Deep Space Network. Anything happens on the, in, the, in the DSN, you write it up with the PFR in five copies. So, you know, the, the golden rod, the white, the pink, the the blue, and ultimately these things document all the issues and all the fixes across the DSN. So we want to use this for this workshop to document ideas, uh, uh, issues, items that you think should be uh, considered both during the discussions here and going forward in the future. Um, there is this slide deck which you will see when you get to your sessions, which is a template for the final reports that we are hoping will be produced. It's intended as guidelines, not as a constraint on your conversation. So please feel free to let your conversation roam in three major blocks. So the goal is to produce this initial report that uh, Giuseppe talked about. Uh, it's going to be consolidated over the next couple of months and turned into a product which will be delivered uh, to organizations around the world, beginning with the ICEF uh, in March in Japan, we hope. Uh, we are they're going to be looking at three major categories, uh, which you've, were discussed in the, um, in the program that you received. One being the uh, technical framework or architecture for the Lunar Village. Looking at it not as a snapshot, looking at it not as, a, as an object fixed in time, but rather as an evolutionary 
uh, consideration, an evolutionary future. A near term, middle term, far term. Uh, also associated with the architecture and the technical framework for the moon and cislunar space, what are the business opportunities? What are the missions and the markets that drive the development of systems and the definition of the architecture going forward? And lastly, uh, at a, the cross-cutting topics uh, that have to do with the coordination and cooperation to execute a moon village vision over the coming decades. And that includes both intergovernmental, government and industry, university and government, and so on and also the cultural, cultural considerations and opportunities that are presented by the pursuit of the Moon Village concept. I've got a little bit of, of general background that I'll just go through quickly, which you all know, and has been highlighted by the, uh, uh, by the discussions of the last uh, three quarters of a day. There are a great many government programs which are being looked at in terms of missions, uh, in the near term, uh, robotic orbiters, robotic landers, and so on, rovers. There are also a range of uh, major projects and programs which are under consider consideration, such as the Gateway, which was described this morning by Lockheed Martin. Uh, there are also uh, commercial services and commercial ventures, both by major players and by startups that have been talked about. Uh, and there are um, uh, commercial-oriented uh, commercial oriented um, uh, services that it would be provided uh, from the commercial vendors for government missions and science activities and so on. Some examples, just to highlight them, these have already been talked about. Uh, the small fry in the next few years, uh, by small fry I mean smaller missions like the Google Lunar X Prize, uh, the uh, missions from India and from China. That's to 20, by the way, definition. Uh, 2022 is the definition of uh, near term. So near term is today, 27, 2017 through 2022 approximately. The midterm, uh, there's a wide range of activities, including development and deployment of the, uh, the gateway, which is being planned, uh, global exploration of the uh, moon surface, a lot of discussion from various uh, presentations about uh, options for different roadmaps for how to proceed from the initial smaller missions to more extensive exploration. Uh, various commercial plans and projects, uh, such as iSpace, which we heard about, uh, such as uh, the Bigelow uh, module, and so on. And then there are wild cards, things that might come or might not come. Uh, the, the, sort of the, uh, the big visionary things that have been talked about, for example, having to do with uh, uh, Blue Origin or uh, SpaceX or others. And then there's Beyond 2030. So this is the more canonical, uh, you know, based on the moon, the big, the big things there. Uh, discovery and development of, uh, of extractable materials such as um, uh, water or other volatiles. The local uh, fabrication of, uh, sorry, local fabrication of locally fabricated habitats. So that's redundant, I apologize. Uh, locally fabricated uh, uh, systems and habitats. Uh, the local construction or fabrication of power systems and so on and so on, and a wide range of cultural activities that might be undertaken. For example, media-related uh, business opportunities if there really were a, uh, a long-duration, large-scale uh, human and, uh, presence and activity on the moon. There's a range of capabilities. One of the things we'd like to ask you to focus on today is what are the capabilities that would be involved and make sure these things get identified and uh, their items to be discussed and considered, uh, things like uh, landers, rovers, uh, the gateway itself, and so on. Over time, these things change and evolve in the nearer term, smaller and more modest, in the far term, grander and more ambitious. Ultimately, one of the things we hope to use these inputs for, from all of you, is to construct an integrated international roadmap, which is a strategic framework for all of the planning that everybody is doing and make sure that it's not, 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 not the same as, but not inconsistent with the various roadmaps which are being developed by, by many, many organizations and individuals around the world. Uh, I won't go through all of these. these this is the standard list of suspects uh, and it changes over time. So in summary, we're looking over the next uh, day and a half at um, a wide range of potential activities government missions and projects, commercial services to uh, government missions and projects, and also to other commercial ventures, and then commercial ventures themselves. 
as well as cultural activities. And we're looking at all of the coordination and cooperation issues that arise from essentially the whole world going to the moon uh, and, and operating at, uh, in cis-lunar space over the coming few decades. These are the breakout sessions. We are organized according to a matrix. Uh, the, this afternoon begins the discussion, doesn't finish the discussion, begins the discussion of the technical framework for the Moon Village. It's basically the, the overarching architecture, systems, capabilities, functional requirements, all of those things. Tomorrow morning, uh, we'll be discussing the business opportunities that arise. What are the missions and markets that might be there? We had a, a nice highlight from uh, uh, Lockheed uh, about the whole idea that the gateway will be there and it'll be open for business. Well, that's a capability. What are the business opportunities? What are the missions and markets that could be pursued using that capability? So that's a nice uh, tie-in to the conversation we want to not just have, but to document this afternoon. Uh, and then tomorrow afternoon, the coordination issues, uh, all of the things that we talked about in brief, uh, having to do with, uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the, the Moon Treaty or the uh, outer space, the law of outer space, uh, and so on, as well as the various cultural aspects, uh, the, the, uh, the, the human heritage sites which are on the moon, the things that could be done with regard to entertainment on the moon, and so on. Obviously, all three of these are interrelated. The capabilities, the architectures are close related to the missions and the markets, and the capabilities and the missions and the markets are directly related to cultural activities, and all of those drive the needs for cooperation and coordination. Some key examples are provided. Uh, these will be available in your individual rooms. I won't go into them. But for example, what kinds of surface systems, both near, mid, and far term? Uh, in the longer term, what about the development of lunar resources? So what about issues associated, which was highlighted earlier, where uh, lunar mining or lunar resource extraction might uh, compete with lunar-based astron lunar astronomy, and so on? Uh, what about all the supporting infrastructures, such as space transportation, uh, the gateway, uh, fuel depots, all of those things, looking out near-term, mid-term, and then the far-term. So this is an ITBC. Uh, the template is very simple. It basically is a, one, a, a simple title. This is the issue or the item to be considered. Then who made it up, who submitted it, your name, your contact information, so we can come back to you and, and ask you, did we get this right? Or we can come back and say we have a question. and. Uh, Basically, you know you wrote it, but we'll, we won't know that you wrote it. If we get a bunch of them that are similar, we'll have to somehow aggregate into the best report, and we want some traceability back to you. Uh, what the, the, uh, what's a longer-term description? No, sorry, a longer description, a sentence or two or three, not a, not a uh, you know, a 10-page essay, but something that's uh, both the descriptive, self-explanatory, and tractable. What's the time frame? Is it a near-term thing? Is it first originate in the midterm and then go forward? Does it originate in the long-term and then go forward? Or is it really applied to all time frames? Uh, don't just talk about the weather. Do something about it. So don't just identify an issue. Make some suggestions about how it could or should be resolved. How do you, how do you work these things? How might, in the last one, uh, how might near-term progress be made over the next year, two years, three years, to march forward in addressing this item or this issue. Tomorrow we'll be talking about the breakout session group two and group three, same drill, same ITBC form. I'm gonna go through these tomorrow, not this afternoon, because I wanna refresh your memories tomorrow morning when we talk about what got done today. Same thing with co coordination, cooperation, and cultural aspects. All of you have, I hope, to the extent that everybody was registered and I got your names from Chris, and Chris got your names from the, from the, uh, uh, the, the team here at ISU, all of you have been pre-assigned to one of the six teams. Your names are up on a wall outside, if you go out to the top, as you head back towards the stairs, and you're gonna be in that team, team one through team six, the rest of today, and all day tomorrow that you're in the breakout session. So there'll be no moving from that team. So we'll have a little bit of, of, uh, of time invested over the next few minutes to when we break.
to figure out where you are in the, uh, in the machinery. But once you're there, you're there. Uh, the room numbers are here. The boardroom is upstairs. Um, 15 and 16 uh, are here on this level, as I recall. Uh, and 1302, I think, is downstairs. But there's signage that will direct you to the rooms that you're going to be in. If you can't stand the people that you're with, speak to your rapporteur about moving. Your rapporteur has all the information, all the, all the other sessions. But please try to get along. If we can't get along in a breakout session, it's hard to see how we get along for the moon. Don't pack up quite yet. Don't pack up quite yet. Yes. Oh, no, no. I know it's not. I know it's not. Yes. Only, I was only commenting because you made the presentation. But absolutely. Yes. <laughs> they still have to stick with it. Okay. Now, hold on for just a second. Let's, let's, uh, so please hold on for just a moment and then we'll break. This is an example of the matrix that shows where everybody got designated to. I've tried not to put individuals from the same organization in the same breakout session. So I've tried to distribute everybody uh, uh, reasonably so you're not clumped. These are all the folks from ISU, the, the faculty, the staff, and the students. Down at the bottom, you see the, the, the names in red. We have a group of excellent ISU uh, master's students who have all volunteered to be the rapporteurs in the breakout sessions teams today, tomorrow, and tomorrow afternoon. This is the lineup for the breakout sessions. A key feature is that, oh, no, nah, that worked poorly. A key feature is, although you as a team are in the same room this afternoon and tomorrow, the people who are the subject matter experts here in the room, not the students, uh, will change in terms of whether or not they're a participant or they're one of the moderators. So a group of people who are here, the subject matter experts, are being asked to be moderators in breakout group number one, the six teams. All six teams are looking at the same issue, i.e. the architecture for the Moon Village looking out over the next several decades. Tomorrow, it's another group of 12 subject matter experts all of those individuals will be in charge for the discussion of the, uh, and working together, uh, for the discussion of the uh, markets and uh, missions. And during that discussion of missions and markets, you should consider, continue to consider architectures and continue thinking about ITBCs and writing those things up. Uh, and then tomorrow afternoon, another 12 will be the uh, moderators for the discussion of coordination, cooperation, and cultural considerations. The constant element here are the rapporteurs. The rapporteurs are going to be working semi-independently. They'll support your, the moderators as the moderators wish, but in addition, their assignment is to capture your discussions and help to turn them into ITBCs. One more consideration here. Not everything can possibly happen in the six hours, now it's only five and a half hours, a delegate, de designated for this exercise here at ISU. Because of that, this book, i.e. entries into this ledger, will remain open for one week, i.e. look at it as an opportunity, think about the format, think about the discussion. If you get back to your, to your home base, uh, whether it's uh, Budapest or Tokyo uh, or Beijing or wherever, and you suddenly have a really good idea for something that should be put in, you have one week from the end of day tomorrow to send it in, and it's just like it happened here. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. In some conversations, you have the best idea in the room, at least that's your opinion. You can't get a word in edgewise. This makes sure that your thoughts are not lost. Um, here's an example. Uh, so, for example, uh, what would be the characteristics uh, for evaluating, uh, for an open source evaluation tool for a moon village architecture? It can be really hard to look at a bunch of architectures that are defined differently by different organizations and so on. This is applicable to everything. Uh, and this came out of the discussion from the uh, architecture group. Uh, where are you? So. The chair of the architecture working group uh, is uh, Bert, not Bert, um, Blair. 
Uh, Blair will be uh, coming around to chat with you a little bit. You're also getting in your package for this afternoon some three reference documents that give you uh, information about past Moon Village and related uh, lunar architecture studies. Uh, so this came from, uh, from his working group's uh, activities. And how might this re be resolved? Well, one way would be uh, for the Moon Village Association to support the definition of a small number of key common technology metrics, what are called key performance parameters at NASA these days and within the, the US DOD. And KPPs, if they're commonly defined, would give you a basis for saying, okay, this is gonna deliver, uh, you know, a, it's gonna be a three ton lander that's delivering five grams. Here's a 300 kilogram lander that's gonna deliver 10 kilograms. Gives you a basis for comparing different potential options. I'm not saying we're gonna get to that level in today's discussion, but the definition of such common metrics might be very useful as we go forward and try to orchestrate a, a global effort toward the moon. In addition, your conversation will likely touch on uh, major issues. What are the major issues that get discussed? The rapporteurs are gonna have ca help capture those things. What are the key challenges in the near, mid, and far term? What should, we've talked about the, rel the roles of government and industry and so on. Uh, what are the things that the Moon Village Association should be thinking about focusing on and making the central uh, uh, purpose for the next workshop. And, how, and please help us to start planning for that in your discussions over the next six hours. And of course, uh, over a beer this evening when you have got together and you're talking about either this is going so well or this is such a waste of time. Hopefully it's going so well. Any other questions? No? Come on. Not too many questions. Everybody wants to see what group they're in. <laughs> yeah, I know. Please. Will there be a public-facing uh, version of this uh, this framework so that anybody on the internet can submit ideas too? The, the, the focus, in order to avoid it becoming the whole world, the focus at the moment for this exercise are the people who are...